Hello everyone, this is uh, Dr. Vishal Sharma, principal at Meranoia Inc. and uh, prin uh, you know, owner and moderator of the Carry Ethernet Group. And I'm back with another one of my network architecture and design series of videos. And I have a very interesting topic that I want to discuss and explain uh, to all of you today. And that is, how do schedulers in routers work? And what we're going to do today is we're going to understand some very fundamental schedulers, such as the round robin scheduler, the weighted round robin scheduler, the weighted fair queuing scheduler, which actually depends on the generalized process sharing concepts, and the deficit round robin scheduler through very simple examples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one example uh, of certain queues that need to be scheduled, and you're going to work through all of these different kinds of schedulers through that one example. So it will be very easy for you to see the differences between these schedulers and how they actually work. And this has been motivated by actually a companion discussion that came up in the carry Ethernet group that I moderate, and also a lot of discussions that have come up over the years uh, with various clients that I've had an opportunity to work with, both service providers and vendors, where the operation of these schedulers is often a, something that confounds people and confuses people. And that's because you have to have a fundamental level understanding of how these work to be able to decipher how the different vendor variations really work. Because all of the vendor variations that you might look at, whether it's from Cisco, Juniper, Alcatel, Brocade, you name it, uh, are fundamental variations of the examples that I'm going to actually share with you today. So once you understand these and you have a grounding in them, it's always possible to map that into different vendor implementations. And of course, these examples in turn are based on a lot of theory uh, that has been developed over the last 20 years through the classical papers that I give you a reference at the end of, you know, starting with Parikh and Gallagher at MIT, who started the notion of generalized process sharing, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the discussion, uh, to uh, papers that talk about deficit round robin and modified deficit round robin, to many other papers today which apply the same concepts in the wireless world, whether it's uh, LTE or 5G. Uh, or you know modified Wi-Fi and what have you. So let's get started. Uh, so before I kind of jump into the schedulers, it's important to look at what are the basic schedulers that we have available. Well, you start at the very beginning with the basic first in first out FIFO, where packets come in, packets go out. There's really nothing to schedule. You just schedule. You queue packets in at the back of the queue. You you take them out from the front of the queue. And that's pretty much all the scheduler does. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that all different media types and all the packets end up in one queue. So there's really no way to differentiate between different types of data. If you had voice or video or, or bulk data transfer traffic, it will all end up in the same queue. It's simple to implement, but not necessarily optimal from providing any kind of quality of service. Then you go on to the notion of having separate FIFOs for separate types of traffic and using what's called a strict priority scheduler, where you give a strict priority across these different queues in parallel, and you go down them in a certain order. And then, of course, there are other variants of them, like the round robin and weighted round robin a set of schedulers, the weighted fair queuing scheduler, which leads to class-based weighted fair queuing that we've heard a lot about. Uh, you can find that all over the internet. And then there is deficit round robin and weighted deficit round robin, which leads to uh, a combination uh, which is called modified deficit round robin that I'll talk about. And then finally, you can put schedulers in multiple levels of hierarchy, and that's called hierarchical scheduling. So we're going to walk through all of these. Now, the FIFO is, let me stop the screen share for a minute, come back to you guys. So what my goal, as I said earlier, is to look at all of these schedulers through just one example. And it's going to be the same example that we're going to go through and work through how each of the different kinds of schedulers schedules packets for that particular configuration. And that will help us understand, A, the differences between how these different schedulers work, the trade-offs, B, and, and what the trade-offs are when you use one scheduler versus the other, and C, to get a conceptual understanding of how each of these schedulers works. So let me go back to my screen share uh, and continue with that. And let's go and talk about strict priority scheduling. So a FIFO scheduler really requires no explanation. I mean, every one of the four queues that you're seeing here 
is essentially a first in first out queue. Packets come in at the back end. They are pulled out by the scheduler from the front end. Now, in a single FIFO queue, as I said earlier, all the different data types would end up in the same queue. So clearly, there's no way to differentiate between uh, packets that require different kinds of treatment. So we come from there to a simpler concept of providing one queue, one FIFO queue, to each of uh, each of many different traffic types or each flow. So in this case, you can think of these as four different queues or four different flows, A, B, C, D. And the packets that you see here are basically labeled by the queue and a, a number which indicates the numeric uh, the numerical number of the packet in the queue. So A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, and so on. While the number inside of each packet indicates the number of bytes or bits in the packet. We can think of them as bytes. So our nomenclature for every example is going to be these four queues, A, B, C, D. We can sometimes think of them as queues for four different flows, A, B, C, D, or we can think of them of, of such slightly more general queues that have traffic of a different type, potentially belonging to different flows, all ending up in these queues. So one could be voice, one could be video, one could be data, one could be bulk transfers, you know, however you want to think about it. And the numbers indicate the sizes in bytes of that specific packet. And the scheduler is always going to be noted, denoted by the circle. And the abbreviation inside the circle is going to tell us the specific kind of scheduler we are looking at. And this little arrow here indicates the order in which the scheduler is going to go around serving the packets from these four queues. So that's going to be our basic example. So let's start with the strict priority scheduler that I've shown you here. The strict priority scheduler basically means that the scheduler serves queues A, B, C, D, or 1, 2, 3, 4 in strict priority going down from A to B to C to D. What this means is that the scheduler only moves to B when there are no packets to serve in A. And the moment a packet in QA arrives, the scheduler will serve the existing packet from QB and come right back to it. And, and there are variants there. You know, Are you going to serve the existing packet fully and then come back to a high priority queue to serve that? Or are you going to serve uh, you know, only a part of that packet, stop your service to a low priority queue right there, and come right back to the high priority queue as soon as there's a packet in there to serve. But in our example here, we assume that each of these four queues are filled with these packets that I've shown you here. There is uh, you know, three packets in A, four in B, three in C, and four in D with the sizes that I've shown you here. And if a strict priority scheduler was to service these, and let's assume there were no future arrivals of packets, it would obviously go to the highest priority queue, QA here, and serve it out exhaustively until every packet in the queue was served and the queue was empty. So which is what you see here uh, as, as a function of time. And I've shown it in two lines because it's not possible to fit all four in a single line in this slide. So you first serve all the three packets of QA. And since that high priority queue is then empty, you go on to serve all the four packets of QB, which is the next in priority. Once that's empty, and assuming no future arrivals, you go on to serve packets of QC, and then you serve packets of QD, which is the lowest in priority. And at that point, if, if more packets arrive, depending on which queue they arrive in, you'll go and serve that. So if new more packets arrived in B, you'd start serving that until something arrived in a high priority queue, let's say QA, at which point you might serve the existing packet at QB and go immediately to serving the packet at QA. And once again, when A was empty, you'd come right back to B and then anything else lower in priority. So fairly simple. Now, some of the trade-offs, as you can see, is that if I had a lot of traffic coming to the high priority queue, it could potentially starve every other queue because I'd keep serving that. And uh, I would never really stop. And likewise for uh, you know any other queue, which is higher in priority than some of the other queues. So if B had a lot of traffic and A didn't have it, uh, you know B could manipulate completely the output link and thereby you know, start out C and D. So to overcome this difficulty, you need something more uh, than just strict priority. You need a way to arbitrate between these different queues. And that's what leads us to the next scheduler in line. And that is a round robin scheduler. So a round robin scheduler, as the name suggests, simply serves queues A, B, C, D in some round robin order. So it starts by picking a packet from A. Having served that, it serves one from B, 
having self directed ones, one, one from C and then one from D, which is exactly what you see as the packets that are served in the first round. So if again, we started with the exact same initial conditions and the exact same queue configuration, and I had a round robin scheduler, I'd go down the list in a round robin order. Now there's no specific priority, I'm just going down them in a the round robin order, pick a packet from A, then from B, then from C, then from D, which is what you see in round one. At the end of round one, you'd go back and then pick the next packet from A, the next packet from B, the next packet from C, and the next one from D, which happens in round two, and then you go to round three. Now, after round three, basically A, C, and D are already empty, and there's only one packet to serve from, from QB, and that's what you go and serve. So in a round robin scheduler, if a particular queue is empty when you arrive at it, obviously there's nothing to do. You just skip over that and go to the next, next queue in, the, in line in round robin order. Now, as you can see here, uh, the difficulty with round robin uh, is that you've got some amount of fairness because you're serving one packet from each queue. But as long as packets are of different sizes, uh, you have a problem because you can serve a lot of traffic from, let's say, D, uh, QD while serving very little traffic from the remaining queues. So as you can see, there's a lot of, they can be, if, if QD was one that consistently received a lot of large packets, and QA was one that consistently received a lot of small packets, then you'd serve a lot more data from D uh, than you serve from A. So that's a little bit of an unfairness. And there, uh, you know, we'll see later that there are ways in weighted fair queuing to mitigate that. But let's look at two variations of round robin schedulers right here. So in the one that I just showed you, uh, you are doing, uh, you're just serving, you know, uh, packets in order from the queues. But there's two ways to actually do that. Uh, so, sorry, let me go back. So this is a simple round robin scheduler. Now, if you wanted to uh, give different weights to different queues, you could certainly do that. And here's an example where you know we've weighted the queues A, B, C, D using weights one, two, two, one. So therefore, what happens next is that what this is telling the scheduler is when you go to QB, you serve two packets from QB. When you go to serve QC, you serve two packets from QC in a given round, and uh, where you only serve a single packet each from Qs A and D. And that's what you see here in this round one, where I pick one packet from A, A1, as before. Then I have two packets from B, because it's got weight two, and then two packets from C, because it's got weight two as well. And then I pick one packet from QD, which is right here. And when I go to the next round, I repeat the exact same process. I pick a packet from A, I pick two packets from C, uh, from B, and now since there is only one packet from C and nothing else has arrived, there's not much I can do. I'm going to just serve that one packet, and then I'm going to serve one more packet from D. And uh, and similarly in round three, you know, two queues are completely empty, so I just serve QA and then B and C are empty, nothing to be done there. I go and serve QD. Uh, as you can see here, what happens in this case is that we are doing bulk service when we go to QB. We serve both of its packets out in succession. And what this leads to, it leads to act, you know, a bunching of packets from different queues in the output stream. So the output stream is, uh, is, is not smooth, uh, where the packets are distributed evenly across and, and inter interleaved with one another. Rather, they are bunched together, which is what you see for round one as well as round two. And this, of course, can lead to uh, you know, variations in delay and jitter as you accumulate these, as more and more bunching occurs, as you move through successive links of a packet network. So one way to mitigate that is to use what's called smooth service, where even though you have weights the same as before, one to two, one, the way the scheduler works is it goes and first serves a single packet from each of the non-empty queues that it's designed to serve. So you have A1, B1, C1, D1 served out. The round's not in, done yet, because it knows that B and C have weight two, which means it's got to serve a second packet each from B and C. So the scheduler then goes back to B and C and serves out the second packet from B and C. And in the second round, it does the exact same thing. It serves a packet from E2. And actually, I'm sorry, this color is wrong. This should be a green color. It serves a packet 400 bytes B3 from QB. And then it continues to serve C3, C3 and D2, D2, and then goes on to serve uh, B4. But what you see here is that the packets from QB and QC 
they are now more distributed in the output stream of packets. So they're not bunched together as was the case in bulk service. And this is a way of smoothing out the output stream. Now, it's not very precise, of course, but it's at least a lot better than what we had with bulk service. So these are two variants, uh, uh, variants of weighted round robin scheduling. Now, as you can see, even in this scenario, if the packets vary widely in size, then the amount of service, the amount of data that you serve from a given queue uh, can be very widely across two different queues. So in order to kind of become more uniform and be more fair, uh, you know, people came up with this concept of what's called generalized processor sharing, which is, of course, not a practically realizable scheduling discipline. It's an idealized discipline. And I've shown here what it really does. So you have, again, four queues as before, one, two, three, four. And however, I have assigned them different weights, four, two, one, and two. And the way GPS works is it assumes that the queues are full of a fluid and that the output link is also a pipe that is capable of taking a fluid in a ratio that's proportional to the weights of the queues. So it serves all of the queues simultaneously, allowing a little bit of the fluid from each of these queues to leak into the output link. But the quantity of fluid that goes out is proportional to the weight of that queue, which is why you see there's a lot more fluid from Q1. Uh, in fact, you know, twice as much as the fluid from Q2, uh, which is, again, equal to the fluid from Q4 because it's got the same weight, namely 2, as Q2 does. And finally, uh, the amount of output from Q1 is four times as much as the output from Q3 because their relative ratios of their weights are 4 is to 1. Now, what this does is that at every instant of time, if I was to take a time slice, I'm sorry, if I was to take a time slice across this link and assume that time is moving to the right, then at every instant of time, the proportion of data that is served from each of these four queues is exactly in the ratio of their weights. And that's why this is an idealized service discipline, because it's assuming that you serve infinitesimal amounts from these four queues in such a way that they fill up the output link exactly in the ratio of their weights. So this is an idealized discipline. It's really not feasible to realize this in practice. So what we do in practice is we build what's called a weighted fair queuing scheduler, which is a packetized version of GPS. And in our specific example, uh, I've taken the same packets uh, that we had in the queues that we showed you earlier. I haven't shown all of them. I've just shown a few of them. And what you're seeing on the timeline is the way in which the packets arrive in time. So A1, B1, C1, and D1 arrive simultaneously at the beginning of time. That's what we assume. And then right after A1 has arrived, A2 arrives, whereas B2 and C2 arrive more spaced in time. And what I've shown you at the bottom is how the GPS scheduler would serve these packets. And then later on, we'll see how the weighted fair queuing scheduler serve these packets. So let's look at the GPS scheduler first. So here's the link of capacity. See, think of it as a pipe like before. Initially, you have four packets, and their weights are 1, 2, 2, and 1. So as you see, uh, for as long as there is data to be served, the GPS scheduler serves them in the ratio of their weights like fluids. And what happens is this service order continues till at least one of the packets gets fully served. And it turns out that since packet B1 is the smallest of the four of these packets, that's the one that finishes the, the first. Uh, and you can calculate that time by assuming that, you know, one, one, uh, one plus two plus two plus one, which is five, that two fifths of this capacity of the link is given to B1, as I've shown you here. And so how long will it take to serve, you know, 200 bytes? It'll take some amount of time. And that's what you see here. So at this point in time, the packet B1 is fully served. Packet B2 has not arrived. So what continue? A1, C1, and D1 are still available. So the remaining capacity of the output link is now divided across these three queues in the ratio of the weights. And the weights are what? One, two, and one. And that's exactly the ratio in which this remaining capacity is now divided. So C, QC is now getting half the link capacity because its weight, namely 2, is half of the total sum of the weights, namely 1 plus 2 plus 1, which is 4. So that's what happens. 
And this process continues till either something new happens to arrive, which it doesn't in this case, or one of the packets that's in service actually finishes. And what we see is that actually C1, which only has 50 bytes remaining, gets served at this point in time. And so only A1 and B1 remain. They're not fully served yet. And so the remaining link capacity now is divided equally, because they have equal weights, one and one, between QA and QD. And that process continues serving these packets in equal, exactly equal amounts until one of these packets finishes. And it turns out that A1 fully finishes at this point. Because if you sum up the bytes served, 175 plus 25, 200 plus 100, 300, which is the original packet size of A1, it's fully served at this point in time in the GPS ideal system. And so at this point, A1 is gone. But as soon as that's served, A2 has arrived. And so as soon as A1 is finished, A2 steps in to take its place. So this process of having half the capacity between two queues A and B continues till something else happens. And the something else that happens is that after some period of time, B2 arrives. And the moment it arrives, because it's an idealized discipline, and it must give equal capacity to every non-empty queue in the ratio of its weights, immediately B2 starts to get 50% of the capacity because it's got a weight 2. And A1 and A and D both get you know, one fourth of the capacity because they have a weight 1 each. And their relative weight is 1 out of 4 uh, each. So they get one fourth the capacity. And this process then continues until something else happens. And which what happens now is that packet D1 finishes. You can again sum all these bytes, and you will see that that is exactly 650 bytes, which is the size of D1. And as soon as that finishes, the remaining capacity is divided between QA, which still has A2 remaining, QB, which has B2 remaining, and QC, because right when D1 finishes is when C2 arrives. And so C2 starts enters service. And the capacity is divided uh, between, between these queues uh, in the ratio with, with B and C both getting you know, uh, two. So the ratio is two-fifths of the capacity, because now it's this has weight two, this has weight two, and this has a weight one. So the total is five. And each B of B and C gets two-fifths of the total capacity, with A getting one fifth of it. And as before, this process continues till one of the packets gets served or something. A new packet arrives. Since no new packet arrives, but B2 finishes, since it had only 100 bytes to go, as soon as that happens, the remaining capacity is divided equally between, again, A and C, uh, divided between A and C in the ratio of their relative weights. So A gets one third, and C gets two thirds of the remaining capacity. And at this point, A2 finishes. There's nothing more in the system. So QC, namely packet C2, gets the entire capacity till that's fully served out. All right. So assuming that this is the order of arrivals of the packets in the queues, this is how the ideal GPS system would serve them. And they would be served out in this order. So what the weighted fair queuing service order is, is really weighted fair queuing scheduler calculates in the background it emulates a GPS scheduler, calculates the finishing times of all the packets in the queues, and pulls packets out of the queues in the order in which they would be served in the GPS scheduler. So in the GPS scheduler, B1 is served first. So B1 is the first packet pulled out in the weighted fair queuing scheduler. Since C1 is served next, that's the second packet to go. A1 is the third to go. D1 is the fourth, B2 the fifth, A2 sixth, and C2 seventh. And so that's the order, service order of the weighted fair queuing scheduler. So the weighted fair queuing scheduler has to do two things. It has to emulate effectively a GPS scheduler in the background, computing the finishing times of the packets in the queues, and then serving packets in the order of their finishing times. So every so often, after serving a packet, the GPS scheduler goes back to all the queues, and it has to then locate among the non-empty queues, which is the queue with the packet with the smallest finishing time, and that's what gets served next. Now, because it has to perform a search, across potentially n queues, if n is the number of queues that you're scheduling over, the amount of time that you will take to do that search, assuming it's well organized, is something of the order of log n. So the time that the scheduler takes 
is much more than any of the schedulers that we've looked at so far, like round robin or weighted round robin, which just go from Q to Q. So they use order of one time. They don't have to really compute or search at any given round. Whereas the WFQ scheduler has to do an order of log and search to find the smallest finishing time of the packet of the next packet or the packet at the head of the next queue, which is non-empty. And so that takes some time. That takes some computation, which is why WFQ by itself is, is in quotes, com a complex scheduler because it needs more computation. So in order to overcome this computational problem with WFQ, you know, Frieder and Varghese, George Varghese, uh, came up with the idea of a deficit round robin scheduler, which, as again, does computation in order of one time. And the way the deficit round robin works is it has two quantities. It has what's called a quantum size, which dictates how much data in bytes, let's say, is going to be served from each queue in each in a given round. And it associated with each queue, as I've shown you here, is something called a deficit counter. And as we'll see later, the deficit counter is essentially a counter that records how much under or over the quantum did you go in a given round. Because let's say, so let's describe this process in two steps. So initially, your round robin pointer points to the first queue in the, in the list, queue number one. Uh, and the deficit counter of, is initialized with the quantum size, which is 600. So the scheduler compares the deficit counter with the size of the packet at the head of the queue. Since the size of the packet is 300, less than 600, it serves this packet and de decrements the counter by the amount of bytes served, which is 300. So the counter reduces to three, from 600 to 300. And then the scheduler sees if the second packet in queue can be served. But in this case, the count in the counter is 300. The packet size is 500. We, we are only allowed to serve 300 bytes, so we cannot serve the packet in this round. And the uh, scheduler moves to the next packet, uh, the next queue and queue, which is what I've shown you here. So the round robin pointer then moves to queue two. Once again, its deficit counter is initialized to 600. Uh, it now sees that the first packet is 200. That can be served itself. Decrements the counter from 600 to 400. Looks at the second packet in queue. It sees that's only of 300 size. That also can be served. So then it decrements the counter from 400 to 100 and sees that now it's no longer possible to serve the next packet because that's 400 bytes. You only have a balance of 100 bytes that you can actually serve out. So the round robin pointer moves, therefore, to the next queue in, in the round robin order, which is queue 3, and whose deficit counter is now initialized to 600, and the process repeats. Okay, So this is pretty much how the deficit round robin scheduler works. Now, as you can see, there's no searching required. Therefore, the order of time it takes to move from one queue to the next in a, in, you know, or one round to the next is just order of one, because you just look at some basic comparisons and you move to the next queue. And so that reduces the complexity of uh, weighted fair queuing scheduling while giving you performance, which is very similar to weighted fair queuing scheduling. In fact, it can be proven that the, the fairness of deficit round robin is about within 3x of the fairness of a corresponding uh, weighted fair queuing schedule. So let, and its time complexity, as I said, said earlier, is order of one. So now let's move on to looking at two variants uh, of deficit round robin. We look at plain deficit round robin through an example, uh, which I'll show you here. So once again, we are back to our previous example, exactly the same four queues, the same packet sizes. And we're assuming that the quantum size is 300. So let's walk through round one uh, of this scheduler. So the scheduler comes to QA. The quantum is 300. So the deficit counter is initialized to 300. The first packet is of size 300. It can be served. It is served. The counter is decremented by 300. So it goes to 0. Uh, therefore, there's no capacity or credit left to serve the second packet. And the uh, scheduler moves on to uh, the next queue in line. Once again, its quantum is initialized to 300. The first packet happens to be of size 200. It can be served. It is served. The counter then decrements by 100, so it reduces to 100. And since the second packet in queue is of size 300, we really cannot serve it, and we don't. And we uh, leave the counter as it is and move on to the next queue in line, which is C. And once again, the quantum is 300. The first packet size is 250. Therefore, it's served. 
the counter is decremented to 50 now. And since the second packet is of size 400, C2 cannot be served. And we move on to uh, the, the next Q, which is D. Here, however, the quantum is 300. The packet happens to be of size 650. So we cannot serve any packet from QD in round one. And, and round one, therefore, comes to an end. At this point, we come back and we start looking at serving packets in round two. Now, recall that the credit that was left in, uh, in QA was zero. When we add another 300, which is the counter, we add that in the second round, we increment the deficit counter by the quantum. We still have only 300 available credit. We have 500 bytes to transmit. We can't really do that. So we move on to the next in line. Here, we had a credit of 100. We add 300 more to it. We have 400. We can serve B2. We do. And the counter decrements back from 400 to 100. We cannot serve B3 because we don't have enough credits to do that. We move on to the next in line. Here again, we have the same issue. The quantum size is uh, the deficit counter had a value of 50 which gets incremented by 300. So we have 350 uh, bytes of credit. The packet is of size 400. We can send it. We don't. And we move on to the next uh, queue in, uh, in line. Here again, our initial quantum was 600, 300. We add another 300 for this round. So the deficit counter reads 600. The first packet is still bigger than that at size 650. We can serve that. Therefore, round two ends. And then so it goes in subsequent rounds. So that should give you an idea of how deficit round robin works across different rounds. And if you really want to understand that, I'm going to leave you with this table. I'm not going to walk through this. But let me explain what this table is. So this table shows the four queues. And the, the columns are the four rounds. And the numbers you see here tell you what happens at the start of a round and at the end of a round. So we are looking at the deficit counters at the start and end of a round. And we are looking at what packet size and what specific packet was sent, if one was sent in that round. So you go through round one, you look at what happens in Q1. Well, you have the deficit counter at 300. The first packet, A1, is of size 300. Therefore, it gets served. The deficit counter at the end of the round is decremented by the number of bytes transmitted, so it comes to 0. You go to Q, uh, QB, your deficit counter starts out at 300 because it was 0 and initialized by the quantum size, which happens to be 300 for all, as I've shown you here. Uh, the first packet in line is B1, which is of size 200. Therefore, it can be served. It is. And the quantum reduces to 100. So in the second packet was of size 300. We cannot serve it. And we move to the next in line. And therefore, you can walk through this column to see what happens in a given round, which packets get served, and what are you left with at the end of that round. And then the numbers you see here for round two are just this initial deficit value at the end of round one, plus the new quantum which gets added to the deficit counter for every queue in a given round, every non-empty queue. So if the queue is empty, then you don't actually increment the counter because you don't want to build up an untold amount of credit uh, on one given queue. And therefore, you don't want to allow that queue to be served. You know, If you built up a lot of credit and then suddenly a lot of packets arrive in that queue, you would be able to serve all of those packets uh, to the detriment of other packets waiting in other queues, and you don't really want to do that. So the deficit counter is only incremented by the quantum size in a specific round if that queue is non-empty. And as you might imagine, you can also have a weighted fair queuing, weight, weighted variant of DRR, which is what I show here. And what we've done here is, as before, we've assumed that A, B, C, and D have weights 1, 2, 2, and 1. Uh, the weights are actually reflected in the quantum size. So we assume that the base quantum size is 300. But because B and C have weights twice that of the simpler queues, their quantum size actually is 600. So it's the base quantum multiplied by the weight. And that's what the quantum is for every round uh, when we increment the deficit counter. So their quantum is 600. So let's do uh, the same thing we did for a simple DRR. Let's do a first round walkthrough. So we start at the beginning of the round. We inc increment the de deficit counter, which is initially 0 by 300. We see that the first packet is 300 bytes in size. We can serve it. We do. The counter decrements to 0. We cannot serve any more packets. We move on to the next queue. Here, the quantum, si qu uh, quantum size is 600. Therefore, our deficit counter is 600. We serve B1. 
Determine the counter to 400. We see we can also serve B2. We serve B2. Determine the counter back to 100. Now we cannot serve B3, so we move on to the next Q in line. Once again, because the weight of C is also 2, its quantum size is 600, we can serve the first packet C1. We are left with uh, you know, uh, uh, a credit of 350 bytes, which, has not, which is not enough to serve C2. Therefore, C2 doesn't get served in, in this round. And then we come to QD. Our quantum size is only 300. Therefore, our deficit counter is 300. And we need to serve 650 bytes. We can. And therefore, the round one ends. Um, and then if you go through the same logic, you'll be able to see that in round two, uh, you know, you are able to not serve A2 because you only have uh, a deficit counter reading of 300, not enough to serve 500 bytes. Uh, in QB, however, uh, we left off with a quantum size of uh, uh, 100 and we add 600 to it. So we are at 700 and therefore we can serve both B3 and B4 because that's only 700 bytes. That's exactly what happens. Then the deficit counter is zero. So there's nothing more you can do in QB plus you don't have any packets. So you move on to QC, where again, we left off with a deficit counter of 350 to which we add you know, a quantum size of 600. So our count reads 950, which is exactly enough to serve out both C2 and C3, which is what happens. And then when we come to QD, uh, remember our deficit counter, we left it off at 300. We add another 300, which is the base quantum to it. We are only at 600 bytes, still not enough to serve a packet of size 650. So there's nothing we can do. Round two ends. And so it goes. And so again, if you want to see exactly how to walk through these four rounds for this particular packet configuration, that's shown here, where the, uh, where the you know, nomenclature uh, is exactly what it was for the simple DRR. We look at the deficit counter at the beginning and end of a round. We look at the packet that was sent and what size of bytes were sent out. And here on the right hand side, to remind you, I've given you the weights of the different queues and therefore also their quantum size, which is a multiple of the, of the base quantum size. The base quantum size, of course, is 300. So if you were to work through this example, you'll see that exactly this is the order in which the packets happen to get served. So that, friends, is the four different base schedulers. And what you can do with those is you can com compose them in different formats. And let me show you, shift to some homegrown, good old handwritten notes here so that I can uh, do a screen share with you and show you how you can compose these schedulers uh, to create something interesting uh, or kidoki. So now I'm sharing uh, my handwritten drawings, uh, which I'm going to walk you through for the rest of. Uh, part of this discussion. So, of course, you can have a scheduler which is just based on a FIFO queue, which is very simple. Then you can have a round robin scheduler where you are round robin across uh, different kinds of queues. These can be queues that are based on a per flow basis or queues that are based on some kind of a more aggregate uh, in a classification of data. And of course, you can then build a very similar structure for a weighted fair queue kind of queue. The only difference between a weighted fair queue and a class-based weighted fair queue is that in a weighted fair queue scenario, you assume that every single flow adds one more queue uh, to, to be scheduled across. And in class-based weighted fair queue, you have a finite number of classes into which you're classifying your packets, and you have as many queues as there are classes. And then, of course, a uh, very similar structure for DRR and WDRR. And all of these schedulers have a single level scheduler. You have only one level of scheduling. Uh, you can, however, compose those to make slightly more complex scheduling uh, mechanisms, as I've shown you here, which is a combination scheduler of a priority queue and a set of queues that have uh, a scheduler of their own. Uh, and, and this particular scheduler here can be any one of the ones we've studied so far, which is it can be round robin, weighted round robin, weighted fair queuing, deficit round robin, or weighted deficit round robin queues. So the way this whole mechanism Composite queue works is that the strict priority scheduler picks to serve packets from the priority queue or the low latency queue, as I told you earlier. The only difference between a priority queue and a low latency queue is that if you had a priority queue, as long as there were packets in it to be served, the, the strict priority scheduler would keep serving them. And it would only go to serve these other low priority queues when this priority queue was empty. Now, assuming that there was a period of time when this queue was empty, it would go to these queues and serve them 
according to the scheduling discipline of this scheduler, right? And then again, if something came back in the priority queue, then you'd immediately come back after serving the last serve, you know, the packet in service, you'd finish that, and you'd come back to serving the priority queue again, right? And uh, in particular, if you have a scenario where you have a priority queue combined with a second level scheduler, and that scheduler happens to be DRR, then that is known in the industry literature as modified DRR or MDRR. So that's really all it is. It's a priority or low latency queue together with a bunch of low priority queues that are serviced using a DRR scheduler. And then you can have another variant of this called prioritized weighted fair queuing, which is essentially what I've shown you here. The concept here is that you have queues at different priorities, priorities one through n, like I've shown you here. Uh, you can have one strict priority queue and then several other queues at different priorities. And the servicing of the queues at a given priority is done using a weighted fair queuing scheduler or a variant like WRR, DRR, WDRR, and so forth. So here you have strict priority across these four different prior, you know, n different priority levels. And once you are at a given priority level, assuming all the higher level priority queues are empty, because that's the only case in which you'll arrive at a lower priority queue, you will serve these queues, which are all at equal priority. Uh, they are, you know, they're basically equal to each other using this WFQ or some variant that you've decided uh, you need to use at this level. So this is prioritized weighted fair queuing. So as you can see, you can take these fundamental schedulers that I explained to you, and you can compose them in different ways to create more complex scheduling. And then the sort of more most involved one of these is what's called hierarchical QoS or hierarchical scheduling. And that's usually good when you have multiple levels of aggregation. So if you work backwards from here, you might have a customer traffic which is divided into voice, video, and data. The customer traffic is scheduled using a customer queue, uh, that, you know, which is maybe based on a customer VLAN. Uh, at a, the next level, you have uh, several customer VLANs that are scheduled uh, across uh, a, a SVLAN level queue. And then at the highest level, you have a link-based scheduler that is scheduling across multiple SVLANs. If you look backwards from the right to the left, the way it works is that the link level scheduler is apportioning bandwidth of the outgoing link between these level one schedulers. Once they have been assigned a given bandwidth, the level one schedulers apportion that their share of the bandwidth to their level two schedulers. And the level two schedulers, in turn, uh, then service the, the voice, video, or data queues using the amount of bandwidth that has been handed out to them by the level one scheduler. And as you can imagine, this is extremely helpful when you're amalgamating traffic, uh, you know, different data, tra different customer traffic, or different flows going into a higher level flow and a higher level flow at the, you know, service provider level, uh, going into perhaps a traffic engineering tunnel or a larger service provider aggregate, uh, which is then served out on the link. So this is a hierarchical, you know, queuing scheme uh, that we can use. Uh, and so I want to go back to my slides now and show you what I have here. So as I said earlier, class-based queuing, hierarchical queuing, the goal is to provide, enable the link to be shared in some proportion between different classes of traffic or different uh, schedulers. And then the schedulers apportion the, their share of that outgoing link uh, to different leaf classes which could be by application, which could be by aggregate traffic like voice video data, uh, bulk transfers, and so on. So the idea is that this allows you to share the link capacity between different providers, between different enterprises, even between different applications like voice video and data. And so the higher level scheduler is called a linked scheduler, and the second and third level schedulers are called general schedulers, which, as I told you earlier, could be variants of uh, one of the many schedulers we've looked at before, which is RR, WRR, WFQ, DRR, and WDRR, right? And and the end, I've given you uh, several references for more reading. Now, the subject of scheduling is 20 plus years old. There are literally hundreds or perhaps even thousands of papers on the subject uh, and, and the application of schedulers to uh, cable networks to wireless networks to pawn networks and so on. 
Uh, but the best references to get started are references that talk about fair queuing, weighted fair queuing, and deficit round robin on Wikipedia and the associated papers. Uh, the whole concept of round robin and fairness uh, was invented by John Nagel in 1985 in a paper he wrote, which you can see referenced in the fair queuing article in Wikipedia. And it was built upon later uh, to create uh, bit by bit round robin uh, in a paper that Demers, Keshav, and Shankar wrote in 89 or 88. And then in the early 90s, we had, and all through the 90s, we had a classic, uh, you know, a whole slew of papers which became classical papers, starting with the one by Parekh and Gallagher that talked about, you know, GPS in single node and multi node networks. That was in 93, uh, 91, 92, 93 uh, kind of time frame. Then Floyd in 95 talked about class based queuing. Uh, Stadiadis and Verma in 98 uh, came out with latency rate servers. Uh, these are all journal papers I'm talking about. Bennett and Zhang came out with worst case fair weighted fair queuing uh, also in uh, the late 90s time frame. And then Friesen and Varghese came out with DRR in, in, in mid 90s and 95. And finally, Stoika and Zhang came up with something called hierarchical fair service curve queuing, which is the idea of doing hierarchical queuing in, in some fair way uh, in the mid to late 90s as well. And then there's a whole slew of other papers that you can find. But these are the classical papers that cover the theory uh, of these kind of queuing disciplines that we've been talking about. So with that, I think I've accomplished my goal of uh, you know, exposing to you and explaining to you fundamental que queuing uh, disciplines. Uh, I hope this has been instructive. If there are any questions, of course, by all means, please reach out to me uh, through all of the various contact means given in the uh, description of the video. Uh, uh, and uh, you can write to me also at v.sharma, S-H-A-R-M-A, at IEEE.org. That's my email address. And I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, until uh, next time, you know, uh, keep advancing, keep contributing, and uh, and uh, keep uh, keep uh, you know increasing your knowledge. So I'll see you next time. Bye bye.